How's it going, people? Doing all right. It's been uh, stormy up here on Mount Hope. A lot of uh, rain and wind. Still, I'm enjoying the weekend. It's uh, about 9:30, and things got a little out of things got a little out of hand uh, the other night. That absinthe and aloe drink. I think I'm going to stick to something traditional. Uh, dry martini. So, a little extra dry gin. I've already put some ice in here. Two and a half measures. To make it special, some dry, extra dry vermouth. Just about a half a measure or more. All right. Probably too much vermouth now, but oh well. Just for me, anyway. Got the martini uh, olives already lined up. Anyhow, uh, last night I attempted to uh, start a new uh, series where I read from an old time storybook. And things got a little out of hand, a little muddled, uh, got lost in the weeds more than once. At but it, it was a funny introduction, what can I say? I'm going to um, read chapter one. Got to change hats, though. My story time hat. Hey, it's OCD, you know. Um, I started something, I got to continue with it, even if it doesn't make a lot of sense. Oh yeah, a little too much removed, but it's okay. Uh, in the twinkling of an eye. And I found a perfect bookmarker. Some picked cherries. <laughs> Seemed appropriate. In the twinkling of an eye, anyone's eye, or maybe a particular specific eye, chapter one, Taken at the flood. The man walked aimlessly amid the thronging press. He was moody and stern. His eyes showed his disappointment and perplexity. At times, about his mouth there lurked an almost savage expression. As a rule, he stood and walked erect. Only the day before this incident, incident, he was walking sternly. Where's the incident? All right. Uh, this incident, one of a knot of flower girls in Drury Lane, had drawn the attention of her companions to him as he strode briskly along the pavement and in a rollicking spirit had sung as he passed by her. Sniff, starch, wait, stiff starch, straight as a larch, every inch a soldier. Fond o' his country, fond o' Fon o, o, Fon o, his queen, and awfully fond of me. I just can't get that whole, uh, you know, um, you know, um, artful dodger, uh, uh, lies a do little kind of. Sorry, gotta get, got my 
NorCal, you know, approach, that's all. Not going to do accents. If this were absent, maybe. All right. But today, there is nothing of the soldier in the gate of Tom Hammond. All right, wait a minute. I might have written this a little differently. Uh, I mean, there's a way you didn't have to get all expositional like that. You could have done that in one paragraph. Yet, the time and place ought to have held his attention sufficiently to have kept him alert to outward appearance. It is thunk. It was eleven in the forenoon. The place was Piccadilly. He came abreast of Swan and Edgar's. The pavement was thronged with women on shopping bent. More than one of them shot an admiring glance at him. That stud. All right. For he had the face the head of a king among men. But he had no eyes for these chance admirers. <sighs> Tom Hammond was 30 years of age a journalist, we're getting his resume now, uh, and an exceptionally clever one. Examples to come. Um, at the time we make his acquaintance, that's the all-seeing reader, we, the royal we, the Quran and Old Testament divine we. We are not amused. Yeah. Ah. He was a keen, shrewd man, was gifted with a foresight and general uh, uh, presence that were almost remarkable, and hence was commonly regarded by his journalistic friends as a coming man. He had strong fixed ideas of what a great daily paper should be on the internet now. <sighs> but never having seen any attempt that came within leagues of his ideal. He longed, lusted, would not be too strong a term. For the time and opportunity when, with uh, practically unlimited capital behind him and with a perfectly free hand to use it, he could issue his ideal journal, 1918. Uh, this morning, he seems further from the goal of his hopes than ever. So we just slipped into present tense. Uh, all right. Uh, for two years, he had been sub-editor of a London daily that had made for itself a great name of a sort. There were certain reasons which had prompted him to hope to expect to the actual editorship before long. But now his house of cards had suddenly tumbled about his ears. Ah. 
a change had recently take, taken place in the composition of the syndicate that financed the journal. There were wheels within wheels. We're getting all ezekiel uh, The existence of some of which he had never once guessed. The existence of some of which uh, and which in their whirling had suddenly produced unexpected and unspecified results. Uh, the editor-in-chief had resigned and the newly elected editor, they elect the editor, proved to be a man who had years before done him, Tom Hammond, the foulest wrong one journalist can do to another. Under the present circumstances, there had been no honorable course open for Hammond but to resign. That morning, he had found his resignation not only accepted, but he found himself practically dismissed. <sighs> Enclosed in the letter of acceptance of his resignation, was a check covering the term of his notice together with the intimation that his services would cease uh, from the time of his receipt of the check. The old heave-ho. His dejection at that moment when we meet him was caused not so much in finding himself out of employment from, as from the consciousness that the new editor elected had accomplished this move with a view to his degradation in the eyes of his profession. In fact, out of sheer spite, to escape the crowd that almost blocked the pavement in front of Swan and Edgar's windows, he turned sharply into the road and literally ran into the arms of a young man. Tom Hammond! George Carlson, Carlon! The greeting flew simultaneously from the lips of the two men. They gripped hands and had a, you know, a side hug, a Christian side hug. <laughs> All right. But all oh, that's wonderful, cried Carl Carlon, still wringing his friend's hand. Do you know Tom? Yeah, we already know his name. You don't have to keep saying it. Even in dialogue, it's just people don't talk like that. I am actually up here in town for one purpose only, to hunt you up. <sighs> to hunt me up. Oh, let's get out of this crush, old man. Interrupted Carlon. Uh, Carleon, excuse me. Uh, the pair steered their way through the traffic crossed the circus, stopped for a moment, 
at the beautiful uh, Shaftisbury Fountain, then struck around to the uh, struck across to the avenue. In the comparative lull of that walk, Carleon went on. Yes, I've run up to town this morning to find you out and find you and ask you one question. Are you fixed up? Excuse the Americanism, old boy. I've a dashing little girl cousin from the States. If only I could do a good British accent, it'd be perfect. Uh, staying from, staying with my mother and, well, you know, old fellow, how it is. Man's an Man's an imitative creature and all that. And absorbs dialect quicker than anything else under the sun. I just need to hang out with more English people. That's all. Uh, but what I was going to say was this. Are you too fixed up with your present newspaper to forbid your entertaining the thought of a real plump, a real plum in the journalistic market. Hammond's customary alert look returned to his face. He was now every inch a soldier. And they're referencing back to those flower girls who was singing about him. Or at least they were rhyming at him. Uh. As he cried excitedly, Don't keep me in suspense, Carleon. Tell me quickly what you mean. Let's jump into a gondola, Tom. I can talk better as we ride. Really. Get this thing moving. Carleon had caught the eye of a cab driver. And the next moment, the two friends were being driven along riverward. Someone, some Johnny or another, or other, began Carleon. As the two men settled themselves back in the cab, once called the handsome cab, the gondola of London streets, and then there's a redacted section here for some reason. He's so discreet. <sighs> this could have been tightened up just a tiny bit. But it would be even thinner than it, wouldn't it? He caught the quick, impatient movement of Hammond's face and with a light laugh went on. <laughs> but you're on thorns, old boy. To hear about the journalistic plum. Well, here goes. You once met my uncle, Sir Archibald Carleon. Carleon. Uh, Hammond nodded. He is crazy to start a daily, said Carleon. It is no new craze with him. He has been itching to do it for years. And now that gold has been discovered in that land of his in Western Australia, and he is likely to be a multimillionaire, the concessions 
he has already sold have given him a clear million. Now that he is rich beyond all his dreams, like Jed Camp Clampett, <sighs> he won't wait another day. He will be a newspaper promoter. Proprietor, excuse me. It's a case of that kitty in the bath. Tom Dun Da Tom, don't you sure know? That's grabbing for the soap. He won't be happy till he gets it. <sighs> you don't have to drop the soap to get it if you want it that bad. <sighs> I love these old timey books. He wants to find at once a good journalist who is also a keen businessman, one who will take hold of the whole thing. That plum. To the right man, he will give a perfectly free hand. He wants a coming man, coming man in hand. So he can take him firmly in hand, but not too firmly. <sighs> Bedtime story. <laughs> will interfere with nothing, but <laughs> be content simply to finance the affair. <sighs> Sounds too good to be true. But it's a novel, so maybe it just is. Uh, you know, so just could finance the affair. <laughs> I just want to pay her for it, that's all. An almost fierce light was burning in the eyes of the eager listening Hammond. A thousand thoughts rioted through his brain, but he uttered no word. He would not interrupt his friend. Uh, I told you, uh, Nunkums, last night. Wait, I told, I told Nuncum. <laughs> so, I told Nuncums last night when he was bubbling and boiling over with this his project that I had you that I heard you say it was easier to drop a hundred or two hundred thousand pounds over the starting of a new paper than perhaps over any other venture in the world, at least back in 1918. Nunkins just smiled as I spoke dropped a walnut into his port glass. He really likes that tannic acid taste. Uh. <laughs> dropped the walnut into his port glass and said quietly, then I'll drop them. He hooked that walnut out of his wine with the miniature silver uh, boat hook. He had the thing made for him for the purpose. Devoured the wine-saturated nut. I guess he shelled it first then. 
then smiled back into my face as he said, Yes, Georgie, I am quite prepared to drop my hundred, two hundred, three hundred thousand, if it needs be, as I did that walnut. <laughs> and it take the shell off first. <laughs> but I am equally hopeful if I can secure the right man to edit and manage my paper that I shall eventually hook out an excellent dividend for my outlay. I was a man who not only knows how to do his own work well, I want a man who I want a man who not only knows how to do his own his own work well as an editor but one who has the true instinct in choosing his staff of course tom i trotted you out before him he remembered you of course and jumped at the idea of getting you serendipity if you were to be got you got it the upshot of it is nothing would satisfy him but that i should come up by an early train this morning early bird catches the worm and all that kind of business you know, and now, in spite of the fact that my particular worm had wiggled and squirmed miles from his usual habitat, I have caught him. Now, tell me, are you open to treat with Sir Archibald? Yes, and I can begin business this very day. Hammond laughed with the abandon of a boy. As he told in a few sentences the story of his dismissal. Good, Carleon, in his own exuberant glee, slapped his friend's knee. That's right, because they're like uh, in a cab, sitting down. <sighs> Sir Archibald, he went on, was to come up by the 10.05 from our place due at Waterloo at 11.49. He'll be fixed up. Hail Columbia. Again, at the hotel by this time, that's where we are driving to now, and, ah, oh, here we are. That's some great fucking writing. A moment later, the two men were mounting the hotel steps. One of the servants standing in the vestibule recognized Carleon and saluted him. My uncle arrived, Bates, Carleon. My uncle arrived, Bates? Carleon asked. Yes, sir, and a fine lady with him. Carleon turned quickly to Hammond. That's Madge, my American cousin. Tom, in case you forgot your name, I just want you to know I, I haven't forgotten that your name is Tom. So every time I'm continuously talking to you, I'm going to keep <laughs> Tom, Tom, Tom. It doesn't get old, does it? Yeah, this is good. All right. Uh, I'm still dialogue. Uh, 
I'm awfully glad she has come. I should like you to know her. This is good, man. No, really, really. Uh, running a little long here, so I gotta make another martini. It makes perfect sense. It, at least right now it does. get the vermouth right this time. Sorry about that. Maybe I'll edit this out. Probably not. Too lazy. Oh, that's nice. Crunchy. That's a crunchy martini. Ah. Turning to the servant, he asked, Same old rooms, Bates? Yes, sir. Three steps at a time, laughing and talking all the while, Carleon ignored the lift, raced up the staircase, followed more slowly by his friend. Hammond never wholly forgot the picture of the sitting room and its occupant as he entered with Carleon. The room was a large one, exquisitely furnished and flooded with a warm, mellow light. Sounds like a beer commercial, a light beer. A small but cheerful looking wood fire burned upon the tiled hearth. The atmosphere of the room was fragrant, fragrant with a soft, subtle odor. as though the burning wood were scented. From a couch, as the two men entered, a girl rose briskly. I thought men rose when ladies entered the room. It's not the other way around, usually. Hey, that's fine. You know, I'm progressive. Anyhow, this is pretty good martini. America was stamped upon her and her dress, upon the arrangement of her hair, upon the very droop of her figure, those droopy Americans. Ah. She was tall, fair, with that exquisite coloring and smoothness of complexion that is the product of an unartificial, hygienic life. Yeah. Her face could not be pronounced wholly beautiful, but it was a face that was full of life and charm, her eyes being 
especially arrestive. Awfully glad that you came up, Madge, cried Carleon. I've run my quarry down, and this is my own particular Tom Hammond. He made a couple of mockingly funny elaborate bows, saying, Miss Madge uh, Finisterie, for it, Finisterie of Dutchess County, New York. Mr. Tom Holland of Oh Shades of Cosmopolitanism. Cosmopolitanism of everything of London just at present. That is some great dialogue. I'll be like rehearsing this in the shower later. Just kidding. Ah. <laughs> uh. uh. Tom bowed to the girl. She returned his salute and then held forth her hand for a frank, pleasant, uh, her hand in a frank, pleasant way as she laughingly said, I have heard so much of Tom Hammond during the last few days that I guess you seem like an old acquaintance. Tom shook hands with the maiden, and for a moment or two they chatted as freely and merrily as though they were old acquaintances. The voice of Carleon broke into their chat asking, Where's None comes, Madge. Before the girl could reply, the door opened and Sir Archibald entered the room on cue. One glance into his face would have been sufficient to have told Tom the type of man he had to deal with, even if he had not seen him before. This would have done it. He was already impressed, but if he hadn't been until then, he sure was now. <sighs> Even if he'd not seen it before, a warm-hearted, unconventional, impulsive man a perfect gentleman in appearance, but a merry, hail fellow well met man in his dealings with his fellows. With a bit of mock drama at, uh, in the gesture, sorry, um, Madge Finistery, Madge Finistery. God, I hope I don't have to keep repeating that name. I might actually learn how to say it. <sighs> uh, flourished her hand towards a newcomer, crying, Sir Archibald, George, lo, he is here. She flashed a quick glance to the piano as she added, if only I had known you were about to enter, Uncle, I would have treated you to a few crashing bars of stage life uh, entry music. Just like if you you know visiting the Tonight Show, get your own music cue. <sighs> Come. 
Go away with your nonsense, laughed the old man. Nonsense indeed. The girl laughed as merrily as the old man. Then, with a sudden swift movement, she crossed to the piano, struck one sharp note upon it, and whispered in a well-feigned hoarseness, hoarseness, hoarse, yeah, well-feigned hoarseness, <laughs> slow music for the three conspirators as they retired to plot the destruction of London's press. And the uh, accumulation of untold millions by their own special journalistic production. Man, these people are just so chatty. Her fingers moved over the ivory keys and low, weird, creepy music filled the room with its eerie notes. Sir Archibald and George Carleon fell in with the girl's mood and crept doorward on tiptoe. Really? It's hard to picture. I can't even see Nicholas Cage doing that. I can see Kirk Cameron doing it, though. Is he so natural? Number three is the girl. And Tom Hammond, Tom Hammond, laughingly followed with the two other men. She is a treat. She is a treat, is Madge. Laughed George Carlison, Carleon. As the three men passed through the doorway and made for the study room of Sir Archibald. And that's that's it for chapter one. I think that's enough for one night. Anyhow, I, it's got to get better, right? He wrote a sequel. Same year. Anyway, it could be the hat. Um, maybe I've just been thrown off on my reading. Uh, I don't know. Let me know what you what you think of this. Um, I'm wondering where the crapture comes in. Um, it's moving awful slow. I think uh, that one chapter could have been three paragraphs long. And we could have... All right. It could have been a page long. Page and a half tops. With the dialogue severely cut. Anyhow, um, everyone's a critic. Uh, it's written in 1918 in England by, well, a very religious individual, very specifically Christian, apocalyptic, doomsday, death cult kind of guy. It's a, it's a novel, and I sure hope it gets better because I'm going to keep going. Stay tuned. For the crapture. Peace. The fuck. Out. And have a wonderful, whatever the fuck it is you're having. Good night. Sweet dreams. <laughs>